Cool. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Unleashing Innovative Ideas to a Zero Waste Economy. My name is Priti Tulufelandovu. I am the founder of Slow Textiles South Africa, which is a textiles recycling company. Um, I have a background in marketing. I'm a huge marketer. Whenever I meet people, I just want people to connect and see what they can um, uh See what they can uh, um, synergize and collaborate um, about. Uh, so today we're talking about circularity in the built environment. And this entire week, we've actually been exploring various topics within the circular economy. On Monday, we spoke about um, climate awareness and the connection between climate awareness and the circular economy. On Tuesday, we spoke about uh, product packaging. Wednesday, we spoke about regenerative food systems. Yesterday, we spoke about um, uh, apparel and textiles. Today, we're talking about the built environment. This is also an opportunity for me to show off uh, the people that I know, all the awesome people that are in my circle. And um, I would like to just hand over to, to each of you to um, introduce yourselves because uh, I don't want to butcher your, <laughs> your bios as I read them out. Um, Shanae, welcome. Thank you so much for your time. Please introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you very much, Priti. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so I'm Shanae Bloom. And um, my background's in sustainable architecture or regenerative architecture. Um, yeah, I've probably started on this journey um, 10 years ago. And in the South African sort of um, scape, it's, it looks very different um, in the last few years. Um, yeah, I'm also founder of um, Timo Harley which is a, a group of uh, young professionals that sort of affiliate themselves to a design collective. We're down in Cape Town. And um, yeah, I think everyone in the team is kind of, in a way, very passionate about uh, seeing regenerative design in different areas in the build industry. And um, yeah, that's me. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Shane. You're welcome. Um, so it's also COP, uh, the conversations about COP27, uh, or people have been at COP27 for, for uh, a, about a week or two weeks. I think it started on the 6th. Today is the final day. So I'm curious to see what is uh, what the outcomes from there are. It's also Global Entrepreneurship Week. So um, you'll notice in the panel, uh, we, we've got two entrepreneurs and um, I am hoping to connect uh, people from academia with entrepreneurs, with people from the corporate side and also from like um, municipality side so that we can all just um, discuss issues around the hurdles that we have to towards uh, going uh, sustainably circular or going uh, more towards taking climate action, there hasn't been much happening that I've that I've been seeing. So it's one of the reasons why I've decided, okay, I'm I'm going to start a platform myself and um, just uh, connect people. And for once, maybe we can even uh, come out with. A circular economy association of some sort or circular economy group. Um, uh, I know that there are quite a few. Uh, well, I, I know about two that are in South Africa. Um, and they were started by uh, professionals. Uh, the, the, the name of the uh, group is called African Circular Economy Network. And I think there needs to be more and more of these types of groups. So I am excited to have all of you in this room and I really appreciate your time. Um, Peter, I'll, I'll, I'll hand over to you for introduction. Thank you, Pretty. Um, yeah, so my background is in industrial design. Um, I practiced as a product designer for about 25 years, um, ran my own business for about 15 of those. And then got interested in education. And I think um, I really wanted, 
you know, to put something back and to, you know, having benefited from, from um, my studies, I wanted to put something back into the industry. So got involved in education, uh, sort of in about 2000, started taking the final year students at UJ and Chwami for projects. Um, and eventually found my way through to Enscape Education Group, where um, I am serving as the postgrad academic manager. And a big part of what we are doing at Enscape is uh, we, we have recently partnered with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, um, and we are looking at how we introduce circular design thinking, um, you know, into our curriculum and how we not only have it in our curriculum um, and our courseware, but how we live it out on campus. So I'm happy to be here. and Thank you for the opportunity, Pretty. Awesome, it's a pleasure. Miguel, thank you so much for joining. And um, I, I don't think I have your bio, so please introduce yourself. No problem at all, Pretty. Um, so I'm a colleague of Peter's. I've uh, been in the education sector for going on 15 years now. Uh, prior to that, I ran my own interior design and architectural firm for many years, even whilst uh, being involved in education as a part-time lecturer before I moved on to becoming a campus academic manager, um, then a campus director, Western Cape campus director, opened up uh, two new campuses in the Western Cape for Enscape. And uh, I'm now, as of this year, moved into the business development world and uh, heading up the circular economy community with Peter and another one of our colleagues, uh, Mohammed. So that's a little bit of my background. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Amy, welcome. Please introduce yourself. Hi, Pretty. Thanks for having me. Um, so, yeah, I'm Amy. I, my background is in construction management, and I currently practice as a project manager. I've had my own company for just over two and a half years now, born out of hard lockdown and all that nonsense. Um, so my real passion is, is buildings and the natural environment. So the long-term vision for my, my company is to get into property development in my own right and to give it a sort of sustainable green twist to, to the development, uh, developments that are look at being sustainable and community centric. And um, that's really what I'm really passionate about. Um, for the moment, that's still just a dream or a goal. Uh, for the moment, I just build houses for other rich people. Thank you, Amy. Well, that, that should inspire you, right? To one day you'll be, you'll, you'll be building your own um, rich house. <laughs> absolutely absolutely <laughs> yeah so uh, Peter and Miguel I met Amy and Charnay in a business program by an engineering company called Wom Eng um, uh, and it's it, the, the the business program was the circular economy incubator program which was about 12 months to 18 months and they took on uh founders who were starting businesses in the um, green economy and um, just wanted to see if it could help us um, go circular. So at this point, uh, my, my business is like moving away from ideation and we are um, also moving away from research and starting to develop our ideas and we are about to start piloting our projects. So um, I, I look forward to seeing what we can do to collaborate. I know I've mentioned this and um, I look forward to just sharing the journey and um, I hope uh, Shane uh, and Amy can share their journeys with, with us as well and know that we can tap into each other's networks to find people to work with. So um, we can um, go straight ahead into the topic for today. And what I'm doing really is um, exploring various reasons or various, um, uh, yeah, so like various hurdles uh, at, at this point, um, countries in the Northern part of the world have started implementing a whole lot of um, circular projects 
uh, within uh, local communities, within private businesses, but South Africa seems to be, South Africa and Africa seems, seems to be lagging behind. So I have been exploring um, various uh, topics throughout the week with people in different sectors, um, exploring different questions to see really what's, what's holding us back and what is needed um, uh, to, in order for us to achieve a circular economy. So this is the idea that I am um, proposing. As African cities grow, so do emissions. Greenhouse gas emissions in Africa are projected to increase by over 2.5 times to 10% of global emissions by 2050, driven by large transformations in urbanization, in industrialization, and electrification. In South Africa, between 5 million and 8 million tons of construction waste are generated annually. Only a small fraction of it is reused or recycled. The result is that a large amount of waste is disposed of in landfills, which are rapidly reaching capacity in many places. And we know the consequences of all of this on the environment, right? Um, so this I got from um, research by a student at this, which is posted on, on the this um, uh, website. So uh, looking at that, the questions that I would like to ask all of you panelists is, um, waste mi minimization starts with design. What role does education uh, play in the circular economy? And two, what are the most important uh, or the most underexplored opportunities in a waste-free uh, built environment? And then three, what are the key components that will drive the transformation process towards low carbon emissions in the built environment? So from your, um, uh, uh, your experience, uh, your thoughts, your, uh, from what you've seen, within Africa and within South Africa. Um, I'll be calling you out as I see you on my screen. And um, Sharna, you are first. <laughs> For you, uh, what role, um, actually, let me start with the, with the academics and um, I'll come back to you, right? Peter, I'll start with you. What role does the education sector play in the circular economy? Um, I think um, you spoke about the the fact that South Africa is lagging behind, and that the you know the global north is kind of leading this in terms of knowledge and awareness. And I think that's exactly where we come in. And certainly at Inscape, we you know we are, are making every effort to um, instruct and train uh, you know young designers who have an awareness of circular design and circular economic thinking. Um, so for us, it really starts with making sure they understand something about the linear economy um, that we, we find ourselves very much still working within in SA. And then, you know, um, ha having understood the linear economy, then getting them to understand the shift that's taking place towards a circular economy. Um, so it's really about creating awareness. And I mean, I was saying earlier how, you know, I just wanted to personally wanted to put something back into practice. and back into the, uh, the, the sort of the design thinking stream in the country and I think many of our lecturers feel the same way you know they benefit from being designers in industry but it's very nice to give back um, and to share those experiences and to share the knowledge that that you have picked up as a designer um, you know with with young people because by doing that you can have a, a much broader impact um, and as some of you guys might know you know we have five campuses uh, dotted across the country um, that gives us tremendous reach, um, you know, um, in this in this market. So we hope to, you know, do a good job of that, and we we take uh, the responsibility really seriously. Yeah. So that's how we see our role, really, pretty. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, and I, I do have a follow up question with this on, on what you said, which is not in my questions, and I will ask you shortly. Uh, Miguel, I'd love to know your thoughts. Um, what, what role do you think education plays with, within the circular economy? 
Well, I must obviously agree with Peter. We've had a chat about the questions before, before entering in today. Um, but I mean, even bigger than that, I think the term grassroots is used very often within the educational world, whether that be sports or academia. And I think that's exactly where we are, is at the start. Um, you know, and I think it's our social responsibility to enforce this way of thinking, the circular way of thinking, the the need to design with awareness, as opposed to just designing for aesthetic or purpose. Um, and I mean, that's, that is something that I can't talk for all educational institutions, but I know quite a few uh, universities that are taking the same practices as we are at Inscape, where we really are taking the students through that journey, the journey of the material from manufacturing, what kind of waste does that put out there to manufacture a brick, what timelines are you looking at, and etc. So looking at what is the definition A of sustainability and sustainable practices, but more importantly, within their design is looking at that circular, that ability to design, whether it be a space or a product or, or a piece of furniture or anything like that. Um, and I think just quickly before I wrap up is just to give an example of that is uh, recently um, at one of the expos that, that we were at, um, we challenged the students and the staff at our Midrand campus to actually design our expo stand to take back to the different campuses and utilize within that campus space as a functional additive um, piece of furniture or whatever it may be. Um, and it was quite a big success. It was actually at Decorex. There was quite a big um, uh, sort of marketing campaign around it. Um, and, and all of the, the pieces of that expo stand is actually currently being utilized within the spaces at our Pretoria and Midrand campus. So, you know, it's about being hands-on, about taking the students through that journey from day one, because essentially they are the next breed of designers that are going to go into the industry, hopefully stay local and not go abroad and actually start bringing those practices through in, in everyday work. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Amy, what are your thoughts? So, I mean, yeah, what role does the education sector play in the circular economy? And I mean, I think it's huge. Education is huge in absolutely everything. And I think what Peter and Miguel have been talking about now, it's already at quite a high level within the, the education um, chain. I think what's even more important than that is getting younger and younger and younger people involved in the circular economy. Because that's where change really, really happens. If you think about any problem that we have in the world, you think about, okay, the climate crisis, gender-based violence, racial issues, all of that, all of that kind of transformation, it's difficult to change an adult way of thinking. It's incredibly difficult. You've already learned all your life lessons. You've had, you've been shaped by your parents, by your schooling. You've got your idea to change that. It's incredibly difficult, which is why education is so incredibly vital, particularly younger and younger and younger and younger. If you can start preschoolers off with learning how to do things like recycling, and then you go into um, into primary school and you can teach them, you know, other little bits and pieces, get into high school and, 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 you know, start teaching things like the importance of like buying local and keeping things local. And so you, you slowly build on that. And like that, you will, we will eventually get to a point where the change that we all want to see will eventually start coming through. I firmly believe it won't necessarily be within our lifetimes, but you know, it it it's passing that knowledge down to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation, and so it builds up. So I, it, I don't think it's just a role that education plays. I think it's a necessity that education plays in the circular economy and, and in driving it. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank thank you, Amy. Um, I, I love what you're saying about. Um, how we can get young young people to you know more and more young people uh, to participate in um, the circular economy. Um, Shani, what are your thoughts? Yeah, thank you. Um, so okay, I'm not in the educational sector, but of course, how I see it is that part of a kind of a marketing approach in teaching people in industry about things like upcycling or even uh, sort of a current project that or 
uh, you know, project that I'm involved in is um, developing a hempcrete system. I mean, you know, these are these are things that. So, if you consider a hempcrete system, basically, um, there's no waste in in that system. So you can literally, if there's pieces of the actual, call it hemp block. You can literally just crush it and put it in your garden, you know, which is a great thing. I mean, everyone will run to it and use it, right? But it's not so easy. I mean, literally in industry, you have to educate from the architects to the developers to the client, you know, even in something that look as good as that, you know, that you don't need to have a big uh, skip outside that gets dumped in a landfill. You literally can take whatever is part of the system and use it in your garden or use it in like a, a food forest or something like this, you know. But um, yeah, so I think there's definitely space um, for all of us to still learn a lot about the circular economy when it comes to, you know, bringing that change that we actually want to see. And um it's also, um, I mean, something that we were exposed to in um, a, a competition we took part in 2018 in Morocco. It was part of the Solid Decathlon African competition. And basically the focus was to, to come up with a design that is net zero carbon, okay, which is, of course, could speak into the uh, circular economy and sort of waste management side of things. Um, but... Hands down, we were one of two projects that actually considered any bringing in any waste um, uh, sort of circular economy sort of elements into our design. And um, yeah, so, you know, one would think that it's 2022 or it was 2018, you know, people would be more, I mean, especially universities throughout the world would be more sort of conscious of this, but it's not necessarily the case. So I do believe that there's definitely um, a lot that could be could be said about education and and beyond the sector of education, but literally all of us learning um, together. Awesome! Thank you for that, Sharnay, and congratulations on on um, the competitions. Um, so what um here's here's my thought, right? Um, we're trying to share the knowledge with the average South African, right? And not all of them get into academic institutions, right? So I believe that we need to find um, better ways to like spread the knowledge and spread the education. So my job as a marketer, what can I do um, to take what you already have, Peter, at your institution to like, um, I don't know, like make, create uh, easier digestible um, materials that can be shared with like high schools and um, younger kids even that would kind of say to them, okay, we, we have these courses at Inscape um, but in the meantime, this is what you can learn so far about the circular economy in the meantime. So I think um, there, there has to be uh, other ways of knowledge sharing, right? So uh, my follow-up question then would be, what can we do to um, uh, like introduce easier ways to help people that aren't, that will not make it into like the academic institution um, so that they can still have access to this type of knowledge. Peter, what are your thoughts? Um, wow, pretty. Yeah, I think um, uh, having a reach into secondary school ed um, would be very interesting. So if that's something that you, you're looking at doing through your channel, um, I would encourage you to do that. Um, and most definitely, I think if I think people need to, and youngsters need to understand the value in circularity for themselves in order to adopt it. Um, and it's a, it's a really challenging thing to um, convince someone to adopt a circular economy mindset because we're so um, kind of rooted in SA in, you know, the same old way of doing things and our traditional approaches. 
Um, just coming back to the built environment, for example, I mean, there's a huge drive. I see it in interior design, especially, um, and this thing called adaptive reuse, you know, where instead of demolishing a building, um, students are encouraged to look at an existing structure, um, you know, not build from, you know, uh, stage one, but use existing structures and renovate them and, and, and thereby kind of recycle, upcycle a building. So, um, yeah, that's just one example. But Joe, I think the message has to, it has to permeate um, from the top down um, and the bottom up. I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it has to work both ways. Um, and it's, it's a huge challenge that we have in front of us in getting this right. Thank you. Um, indeed. So the, 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 I like your point about the uh, bottom up and top down approach. So we, uh, again, it, it just shows the emphasis on the fact that we all have a role to play, right? Like we can't leave it all to the educational institutions to share the knowledge. Um, yes, you, you, you can do the research. We, we rely on you for the research, the scientific research and the scientific facts. Um, but we also have to find a way to then take those scientific facts and the research um, and, and make it um, uh, like less high level and more like, okay, this is sustainability is actually, it matters to each South African, each African, because we each have a responsibility to find a way to sustain ourselves, to use resources for as long as possible um, and make sure that resources don't go to waste. Um, so then, um, Amy, I'm, I'm going to come to you and ask you this, right? How how can we take the high level um, education that we currently have um, at the educational institution and uh, maybe like just simplify it a bit and share it with the masses? Mm, I had a lot of thoughts while, while you've been talking about this. Um, and I, I think I think it is a it's a difficult one to make simple because I think it is such a complicated issue with so many different facets to it. Uh, depending on who you're talking to, the way you approach that person has to be significantly different for each person. So if you're talking about the average South African, what immediately comes to mind is an average person who has not had a higher education, has maybe got a tertiary education if you're lucky. And for them, their everyday existence is more about survival than, you know, whether or not the climate is an emergency or not. You know, they're just worried about getting food on their table every day and the cheapest way they can possibly do that. So I think that, you know, the first place we really need to start is to, you know, you've got to have the education coming in from all of the different angles. You've got to be educating the people with the money that are going to be spending on these projects, actually driving the physical change as much as you need to be educating you know, the four-year-old on, you know, which bin does my little piece of paper go into. Um, after that, it's, you've got to structure the information uh, in such a way that individuals understand the individual benefits of investing in the circular economy. Like I can go to my construction site as an example and tell guys, okay, please, you know, separate the stuff out into the material out into what can be recycled, what can't be recycled. If they don't fundamentally understand what the benefit is to them of doing that, honestly, I can tell you now, they will actually just laugh at me. And they will, you think, oh, this chain, this poor sweet little white girl, what does she want to do now? You know, literally, that is the thought. So it, it, that's what it's got to, got to come down to. Um, you know, I know we've got in Cape Town, we've got things like on the, on the recycling front, we've got systems where people can collect bottles or cans and they get a monetary reward for that. That immediately says to them, and it's a very, very, very basic level you've got to get the understanding to of, I have a glass bottle, I recycle it, I get something hard in return that I can use that benefits me directly. So, and that is a, I think quite a, quite a challenging thing to, to do because, you know, we understand that at the highest level and we understand the long-term benefits, not just for us, but for future generations, for, you know, saving animals, for, a breathing cleaner air for mitigating health risks. We understand all of that stuff. But for someone who doesn't have an advanced education, however intelligent they may or may not be, those kind of concepts can be very difficult to grasp. 
and you've got to get it in such a way that, you know, let chance in the road, dirty, cleaner air, let chance of you going to hospital for respiratory infections. But that's, you know, it's so it's it's that kind of simplification that you've got to get to, which it is difficult to achieve. Thank you. Thank you. So what I like about what you said, uh, there's a point you made about showing showing the benefits. So if you want to get through to anyone at all, you have to show them what they're going to get out of this entire thing. So um, the, a lot of people don't care much about the environment. Um, but, and this is simply because there's so much going on in life, right? Like there's so much going on. People are worried about surviving. And it's, 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 it's very weird because then the environment is related to surviving. But then you tell them about the environment, then the response will be, no, I'm too busy trying to survive. So, so um, yes, showing the benefit out of uh, changing the way we do things might actually be the key. Thank you so much. Um, Shanae, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think I agree with Amy on, um, I think it's about our relationship with waste, you know, I mean, that could, you could sort of reach into different corners of that sentence. Um, and also what you said, um, pretty about, you know, sometimes, um, people have different needs so to have a good relationship with waste is not really a priority or it's not really what will help you survive um but I was I'm very inspired by one company in Cape Town called Ashanti so what they do is they literally go into um, Madagascar and then they get all the sort of waste materials um fabrics from big um probably well-known brands throughout the world that manufacture their garments over there or their t-shirts or whatever and they have quite a lot of um i mean of course waste coming from the from that industry and uh what's very very interesting and also as um inspiring from ashanti is that they then use this and create different lamp shades that could be used in the building industry of course in interior design or bean bags you know couches um pillows you know different things and i i think that the way they look at the waste of course is they monetized it so they've taken the, the the actual waste product and i don't know if they pay these companies money to get the waste but they use that to actually um create these beautiful upcycled um items and i i think that is you know more stories that that sort of sp speaks into this uh, where they create they create wonder from waste as they call it waste to wonder whatever i mean those are really beautiful examples you know of of how you know waste could be some could be a resource in itself that could be monetized um yeah so that's my two cents. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, Miguel, before I move on to the next question, what are your thoughts around how we can simplify the high level um, academic um, uh, knowledge and just share it with the average South African? No, I think some good points have been raised. Um, I've also followed Ashanti. Um, a little bit here and there. So I'm quite familiar with uh, what Shanae was was mentioning now. And um, you know, one of the one of the little projects that I'm currently working on is is getting into schools. We're currently um, delivering courses every Monday at a school in Pretoria, um, where we expose them to things like design thinking, uh, different variables of the sort of design practices from graphic design to fashion to built environment. Um, and uh, another part of what we're looking at uh, bringing into that next year is circular economy. So there we're hitting everyone from a, a grade eight level to a matric level. Um, ideally, we'd love to get that into 
you know, the primary school side, but um, there's a lot of legislation and rules into us going into those primary schools, uh, which I won't dive into right now. So, but I think the the bigger part there for, for me and what I'm trying to work on with another company is actually getting it out into the more rural areas, um, you know, going into the farm communities and into those networks. Uh, which we're hoping to launch in the new year. So I think, you know, all of these practices that is really about getting it into the communities more so uh, the communities that might not get the exposure that the rest of us are getting. Awesome. Thank you. I love that. So um, I'm, I'm definitely going to be following uh, your work and um, I'd love to be part of it all. <laughs> like if you need uh, volunteers or anything, I mean, I'm in Pretoria, so um, I'm happy to help. Um, so and now, um, if anybody in the audience has any questions, because I can see there are a few people in the audience, please feel free to ask. Um, feel free to raise your hand um, or you can even unmute yourself right now and ask a question before I move on to the next question. If you've got any questions for our panelists, please go ahead. Okay, I don't think there's any questions. Uh, feel free to type in the chat as well. So my next question for you is, what are the most underexplored opportunities in a waste-free built environment. So if we were to say, okay, all the buildings that we are building from now on in South Africa um, go strictly zero waste, uh, what opportunities lie in that? Kita, what are your thoughts? Um, thanks, Pretty. I think a couple of things. Um, I think I've already mentioned adaptive reuse um, being a very strong theme for interior design students. Um, but I think in terms of building generally, I think we often don't consider the longevity of the structures. Um, and we, we tend to focus on the short term, very much in SA. And I think that for me is an important area that needs to shift. Um, we, we need to get people to appreciate uh, the need to think longer term. Um, you know, a building, a building has a huge environmental footprint not only during its construction, but, you know, an ongoing footprint in terms of um, utility bills and energy costs to run that building. Um, and I, I mean, one of the huge uh, things with the, the, you know, the, the green design kind of movement is, has been getting people to think about what are the running costs of that building? You know, is it actually viable? And designing it correctly right from the get-go so that your, all your thermal, your materials, thermal characteristics are correct. Um, you know, things like natural airflow, natural cooling and heating are sort of considered. So, I mean, it is happening. We, we have some superb examples of it um, dotted around the country, but it's not happening enough yet. So that has to increase. Um, I mentioned, uh, Material alternatives, I think, is a huge, is a very interesting one. So I was fascinated to hear what Shawnee was talking about with hemp blocks and stuff like that. Um, I think that's another area that there's sort of um, uh, underexplored. Um, there's not enough uh, awareness really around, uh, you know, what material alternatives are available. Um, I mean, I was thinking about PVC piping. You know, anything with PVC. Um, for those who aren't aware, you know, PVC stands for polyvinyl chloride. So as soon as a product or a polymer has chloride in it, um, th there should be a red flag. Um, you know, so replacing PVC piping, for example, with PEX, which is polyethylene cross-linked material. You know, these these kind of things, people need to be made a more made more aware of them. Um, and again, this is the the role that education, um, I believe, has a you know where education has a big role to play. Um, and then thirdly, uh, I think waste. I think our idea of what is waste, what constitutes waste and how we see waste, um, I think, uh, I think Shawne, you were talking about our, our relationship to waste. Um, I think, I think Shawne put it very well. I think it's exactly that, our relationship to waste and what is viewed as waste. Um, I think that needs to shift because to be truly, truly circular, I mean, I found this talk, we're very much talking about waste. But circular economy thinking is much bigger than just waste. It's all around, you know, value leakage, value creation, um, you know, the entire cycle of, of building and uh, business in general. 
Thank you. That's... Yeah. Well, I, I love the point you made actually uh, in reference to what Chane said as well. Uh, we, I don't think we should even be calling it waste. It starts off as a resource, right? Human beings make it waste because we waste the resource. So uh, yeah, so like maybe the actually the relationship, the language, the attitude toward the resources that we use just needs to change, right? Thank you very much for that point, Peter. Um, and and all the uh, the the opportunities that you've mentioned. Thank you, Amy. What are your thoughts around uh, the most underexplored opportunities? Yeah, so a waste-free boat environment is, from my point of view, being in the construction industry, is uh, particularly the South African construction industry, it's a, it's a very interesting concept. Um, and I wonder if it's even completely entirely actually possible to achieve it. You know, our in South Africa, the boat environment, it's a, it's a very, very, very interesting landscape. We've got so many different factors influencing what it looks like and how it looks and you know we cannot forget the history of South Africa when we're talking about this and the large uh, poverty factor we have in South Africa so like when I think of, of waste free I also think about like what are the materials that we're actually using to build our buildings and what constitutes a, a good building a livable building and here we have a very 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 strong connection to bricks and to concrete. If you don't have a house that's built out of brick and mortar, you don't have a house, you know, and that's kind of a very archaic thinking that has come into place because of the other factors that have, you know, influenced the way our boat environment looks in South Africa. Um, and I think that it's actually interesting. I, I did a, a talk on Monday to a group of international students about exactly this topic. Um, and, you know, the students from, um, from the Netherlands who, you know, couldn't believe how much concrete we have in this country. Like over there, they bought a lot out of timber and other materials. And that again, harks back to why education is so important and why things like education people that there are other materials that you can use that you wouldn't, you know, your house will still be a house. It would still be a good house. You can still live in it. It would still have longevity. And with that comes the education of, you know, why, for instance, I did the massive drive the globe over now to build out of timber, mass timber, becoming very, very popular. Um, there's a guy in industry and an engineer, Damien Mocky, who's driving that scene quite hard in South Africa. And it's understanding that it's a, a product that has minimal waste, is easier to create, has a low carbon footprint, and all of that. So you've got to look into what goes into the different materials. Why do we use them? How can we change people's mindsets so that we're using different things? And yeah. Um, and then the other the other aspect that I want to talk about on this is also the idea of cost. Because like Peter, you were mentioning PVC piping. Now PVC is used because it's cheap. You know, you're putting conduits into a concrete slab. What else are you going to use? You're going to use PVC. It's something you don't want to spend money in on. You want to spend money on your beautiful aluminium doors or your magnificent stone cladding around your house or, you know, whatever fancy other feature that it has a huge amount of weight that you, you actually want to spend money on. So there is also that, that element to it. People want to build quickly. They want to build cheaply and they want to get as good quality as they can. The fact that they're also missing in their PTU with the touch on it is in the long-term implications of all of that. Sure, you've used timber, but can you look after it? That PVC piping, does it need to be replaced? You've got a lot of steel. Building with steel in Cape Town, we look, we're right by the ocean. Corrosion is a massive problem. So the idea of waste, is, it's very complicated. It touches on a number of aspects. And to really, really reach a something that is close to looking like a waste-free built environment, you've got to look into all of those aspects. Um, one final thing that I'll, I'll mention that is quite an interesting place to look at if anyone wants to go and start doing a little bit more research into things that are happening in South Africa to push us towards this is the Green Building Council. So they've got accreditation systems that touch on a lot of these different aspects. They touch on energy, on building materials, on design which as Peter said, the, the number one actual factor in all of this is design. You've got to design for waste-free right from the get-go.
from when your client walks into the, your office for the first time saying, I want to build, that is when you start having the conversation. Once you get to construction phase, it's absolutely too late to be having the conversation. Um, so that's, that's basically what the Green Building Council is, is there for, is to drive things from that point. And they got a lot of very interesting articles. And I'm with an accredited professional, just by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's why I know about it. Um, yeah. Nice. Well done. Well done, Amy. Uh, thank you for that. So, uh, the, okay, my follow up question for you then is what does so, uh, what type of materials would you build with that are sustainable? So, the one that I would advocate for right at the moment is mass timber because it is a product that it, it's a living plant that can be regrown. So, the land that you're mining it from, mining it from, as it were, can be regenerated with the same product again. It's not like stone or sand, which are major materials that go into building. I think people don't understand exactly how much sand actually goes into creating a building from your concrete to your glass. And we are literally running out of sand in the world to build with. You know, you dig up the sand, you use it, it's done, it doesn't come back. A tree regrows. Um, mass timber also has, it's very, very, very quick to build with. It's not like concrete where you've got to, you know, you cast a slab and then you've got to backprop it for, you've got to leave the deck in place for 14 days and then backprop it for another 14 days before you can really start building in it. Mass timber, you put your columns up, you put your floor down, you can work on that floor the very next day. So your construction time is much more limited. It's also a great opportunity to get new skills into the economy, to train new people in different ways of thinking. Uh, so like a huge sort of economic chain that benefits to that. Um, and it's also, it's relatively waste-free. I mean, at the end of the day, whatever your offcuts of timber are, they can go into another product straight away. And the recycling ability of their product is also far-reaching. So yeah, that's the big one that's been advocated to me, and that's not the big one that I'm advocating to, to other people. Um, but there are, I mean, there are plenty of other things out there. Um, I'm also very inspired by the hemp creep products that are coming out by the way people are reusing recycled plastic back into the built environment and slowly tying in and reducing what we consider waste and producing more resources from what we consider waste. Awesome. Thank you very much for that, Amy. Shane, what are your thoughts around the most underexplored opportunities in the built environment? Thank you, Peter and Amy, that's setting me up to just slide right into that Mcrete question, right? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I think for me personally, um, the journey with Mcrete has been a very interesting. Um, let me explain a little bit how it works. So in a Mcrete, in a Mcrete block, you'll typically use two ingredients. The one is hemp shift, which is the small little um, fibers in a hemp plant which is the core of the plant and then formulated lime which is something that we mine in South Africa um, so basically how it works is you then mix the two of those ingredients together and with water and you air dry it um, a hemp plant takes something between industrial hemp now is anything between five to eight weeks to grow from seed to maturity. And you can actually build a sort of average 200 square house with, um, yeah, two or two to 3,000 blocks of this um Plant. So in each block, you get about one kilogram of biomass, which means that you don't even, you essentially, you could actually grow your own home if you want to. Um, so what, what makes this, this building method um, obviously also fantastic is, except for all the amazing properties with fire re ratings and thermal properties and uh, sound insulation, all of this is the is the the place where you could literally, like I said earlier, if you do have a piece of 
of the block that you don't use or it crumbled a little bit on the edge or something you can literally take that and rework it into a garden space um, lots of farmers actually commercial farmers use lime to actually increase um, the alkaline levels in the soil so it is something that commercial farmers are paying money for. So um, in that way, for me, hempcrete, is, I'm very excited about the fact that we now in South Africa, since last year, November, actually um, could apply for industrial hemp permits so that people could grow um, hemp and so that companies like our company could, you know, um, make these hempcrete blocks and then of course uh, change the the way that we actually built um lime is a very interesting um sort of ingredient in this uh whereas we cement of course it takes uh you need to burn it at like a thousand seven hundred or a thousand eight hundred degrees celsius to actually uh, work with cement. Um, lime only burns at a lower temperature, but then of course, when you uh, when you use lime, it sets with air, so it uses CO two to set, which means that when you when you build a building and you cast a slab, you need to water that slab so that it can cure, right? So cement uses water to cure, but lime uses CO two, so not only do you you know, save on waste, uh, waste stream, but you also um, come in as like a, could be a carbon negative building in the sense of um, the, 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 the hemp plants are one of the best sequestrators of CO2 in the world, that in bamboo. Um, and then of course, birth lime that sets with co2 you have a double whammy of like actually contributing to a low carbon or like i said a carbon um, negative sort of environment but uh, yeah let me not go into more detail but i mean yeah if if people are keen to know more about this they're very key they're very welcome to just contact me or whatever but um yeah so i think for me Hempcrete is definitely something that I would love to see more in the building environment in the next hundred years. <laughs> okay. So what I'm getting at this uh, from what you what, what Amy mentioned or what you mentioned, Amy um, uh, Shane, um, it's that there are opportunities in planting in planting more uh, timber, planting more hemp planting more bamboo so the opportunities are in farming right in in this case nice very interesting very interesting um well from from what you said and then it's it's just the 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 farming is just from the raw materials side there is a whole process and a whole value chain in in, in this entire uh, sector right Thank you so much, um, Shani. So, Miguel, what are your thoughts about what the underexplored opportunities um, are? Oh, no problem. Well, thanks, Amy, Peter, and Shani. You guys kind of uh, left me with very little, um, but I can just go on to <laughs> what's been mentioned. Um, it's actually an interesting question for me because I'm currently coming to the end of alterations at my house. Um, was supposed to be a small one, and then a crane fell through my house. Long story, I won't go into it and chopped half of it down. So we've uh, had to be quite um, strategic and uh, play around a little bit because, you know, money doesn't grow on trees. Well, it does, but it doesn't, uh, not in SA. So <laughs> Badger's got a bit shot. So we've been using a lot of timber um, where we can, especially for, um, you know, the internal sides and that kind of stuff, uh, because it was the second story that got smashed out and some of the slab of the of between the two. So, um, you know, we've done something a little bit different and, and it really is from a, a pace cost everything. It's it's a bonus, it's a huge bonus. I'm seeing a lot more of it 
happening on my side of the world, which is more west coast of, of, of Cape Town. Um, you know, more and more communities and people are starting to build, especially a second story or things like that with timber. Um, you know, those kinds of boards are a lot more cost effective than the types of timber that we're seeing in uh, counters on the interior trades, because those are just more expensive than gold right now. Uh, you know, live edge wood and all of that because of, of, of the style and the look. Um, so I think from where I'm sitting, I've been also watching, sure, from pre-COVID, uh, the moment the hemp products started sort of taking the world by storm, where it's still very much frowned upon in a lot of countries, a lot of states because of hemp and don't have to go into the other side of it, um, what it's also used for. And um, I know in Zimbabwe opened it up for farming. Literally every single corporate company I know in South Africa, mainly Gauteng based, was just going after that land, um, you know, because they know where the industry is going. I think it is, uh, you know, like Amy said and Shane, the, the building trade is quite archaic um, in the sense of change uh, and being dynamic and, and trying to, to do things different. Um, there's a lot of reasons for it, um, but I, I would love to see, I mean, I've been following the hemp journey for the last eight years, teaching it to students, Years ago, when I was still lecturing, you know, the hay bale designs that were happening also up the West Coast, I was exposing that to them. And then the hemp came onto the scene and was just mind boggling, just, you know, everything from the soundproofing to, to yeah, you know, all the benefits of that hemp versus the cost as well and the wayside or lack thereof. Uh, you know, I, I agree completely. I just got back from uh, Thailand, Singapore, and Bali. And, you know, the architecture is just, it's mind boggling that we are not doing that, considering how freely, you know, trees grow in our country. Uh, you know, it's just, it's beyond me why we're not using it. Because all over there, everything, you, you, you're going through some of the islands and uh, they're building houses, literally, as they're chopping the tree down, they planting the tree on the side of the road and they making the, the columns. Um, it was really just spectacular just to watch and show that, you know, even in our communities, we should be looking at that, even if we're just targeted at a low cost housing initiative, because it could really save time and money, um, you know, in, in big ways, but at the same time, educate as we keep trying to do our communities, our government, um, you know, who really does make these decisions that there's, there's more benefit in going those directions than the money that you're going to make just staying with the concrete and the brick and the everything else. So I think if we look at it like that, I also agree with Amy, I don't think there's such a thing as a waste-free built environment or, or very difficult to do so. I mean, even with the alterations that we're doing, we've ripped up a lot of things, we've reused a lot of things, but I am a designer, you know, and, and, I, and I do work within circular economy, it's a passion. So it's unique to me and probably everyone else sitting here that would do the same if they were doing it at home. Uh, you know, trying to find homes for the old materials, the couple tiles that didn't get broken <laughs> on the roof uh, structure from the crane, you know, trying to find a home as opposed to a step. Um, and I think that's the other side where I've, I've kind of started identifying just through my journey and what we've had to go through that there's a huge lack of uh, sort of community engagement with needs for secondhand material um so for example you know just trying to get rid of my uh, granite countertops that we we've, we've taken out replacing with wood because it's more into my line and our look and feel um you know and trying to find a home for that you can find millions of people selling it but very seldom people that want to buy it outside of the big men and women where i'm just trying to kind of give it to someone that that is in need so i think what i've also identified there is uh almost a lack of community engagement there whether that's an app whether it's a type of marketplace or or stuff like that which could also try and push this whole movement even foster forward uh, in my opinion yeah thanks thanks for that yes amy well, we're going speaking there. He, I, I thought of something else. He touched on something that I think it's another that we haven't spoken about yet. That it's a huge contributing factor to any of the stuff that we want to drive in industry, and that is legal requirements, legal building requirements. And I think one of the greatest reasons that we are so far behind the rest of the world is because of our building regulations. But currently, our building regulations 
recognized as brick, recognized as concrete, recognized as all of these archaic building practices, and even timber, to get them to understand that mass timber, it's not just building out of like kindling for your fire, you know, it's got an incredibly high fire rating. So all of the new stuff that comes through has to go through rigorous testing just to get it to be something that's approved. Because you can build out of anything you want to, but if you take a plan to say the Council of Cape Town for building approval and you're using a system they don't recognize, you will not get building up approval. Finishing Clyde will be kicked straight out of touch. And that, I think, going back to the previous conversation about education, is one of the most important parts of the entire system is getting higher education institutes to teach the people on the side of making the laws and making the regulations and saying, you know, we can use this stuff. We should be using this stuff. This is why we're using this stuff. The moment you do that, you open up so many channels and so many opportunities. And from there, the education you're feeding into everybody else can actually also be used. Thank you very much for that, Amy. So as a, as a person who, who likes to take complicated things and simplify them in, 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 um, by telling stories, I'm seeing opportunities here to educate people by just, you know, um, I mean, uh, th there's, there's opportunities here for producer and consumer change, right? Like behavior change is a huge thing. That's why people have like very, um, uh, they, they can have the knowledge, but then there's also like, um, people just resist the change because they believe, oh, it's too costly or, oh no, we've always done it this way and it's always worked. So why do you want to change something that's always worked? So I think for me, as a person who likes to tell stories, it would be, how do I tell stories to these people in a way that shows them that it is possible, it actually will cost you less and it actually will be better for everyone in the long run, right? And um, there's an opportunity there. So yeah, thank you so much. Um, before we move on to the next question, uh, would anyone like to ask the panelists any questions or add any any comments? It's okay. I will move on to the next. Shane, would you like to say anything? Yes, I just wanted to say that we have a Agrima certificate certificate now for him block. So please build with him. <laughs> Do you know what that means? It means that because this it's a new building. Uh, product you need um, with our code in the building industry you need to apply for innovative license basically and that's what you apply for with Agrima and yeah we've done that and we got the license so that's that's um, a great step in the right direction to get him sort of on building code. Yeah awesome amazing well done <laughs> Charlene. Um, so so the next question that I have for you all is, what key components will drive transformation uh, towards low carbon emissions in the built environment? So what do we need? Like there, they, there will be different moving parts to get there. What are these components? Peter? Um. Sure. So I think um, Miguel and then um, Amy had touched on it, and I think this is this is where this is so layered. And policy, I think it, it's going to require um, you know government to actually get behind this and to appreciate um, the value that um, exists in in making the switch um, from education. It's going to require you know um, our own institution to continue doing what we're doing. But um, other institutions are also going to have to appreciate the value behind, you know, transforming um, towards sort of more circular, more sustainable thinking to kind of reduce uh, carbon emissions. Um, and I was reading something very interesting recently around um, um, agriculture and how um, by composting and mulching and um, using those sort of old traditional methods, it's actually an incredibly useful way of, they call it carbon sequestration, 
So the soil itself becomes this massive carbon sink. Um, and one of the reasons we, we sit with um, global warming is because agriculture has become sort of industrialized. And when, you, when you're plowing huge tracts of land, and you, you're pumping tons of, of carbon, essentially, soil dust into the atmosphere. You know, carbon is a very good transmitter of heat and, a, and a, it holds heat really well. So um, it, it's, it's just so interesting to me how even our agricultural processes have to shift and change. So I think it's about awareness and I think it's about awareness at many, many different levels and at many different intersections. Um, and, and yeah, it's, a, uh, it, it's, it's, it's gonna take uh, quite a lot of energy to convey that message and to persuade people to buy in. And I think one of the ways in which that can be done is through finding really good case studies on um, you know, where circular economic thinking and circular design thinking has been successful. And you, know, you might look at things like um, Renault, you know, companies like Renault are doing very interesting work um, with, around circularity. Um, and kind of moving towards lower carbon emissions with the you know hybrids and electric vehicles and stuff like that. Um, so are some of the big print printing companies as well. Um, you know, Lexmark, Rico, people like this. So there, there are businesses that have been working on this for quite some time, probably more than a decade. Um, but that type of thinking has to it has to filter into in, into more businesses and become kind of more prolific. Um, and it's not an easy thing to persuade people to do because often there's a higher cost and initially a higher cost. And that is a huge barrier to entry into why people would want to think along circular economy lines because they get put off by that cost and they, they forget to look at the long term, you know, coming back to my point on longevity, they forget to think of the, the product system or service in terms of its entire life cycle. Um, and yeah, so that's where our thinking needs to, needs to shift. Um, yeah, I think that's, I'll leave it there for someone else to, to pick up on. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> I had my mic on the entire time and <laughs> now I've muted and I forgot. Um, thank you for that point, uh, Peter. So policy, education, awareness, and actually showing the different case studies of people who already are implementing this to show that it is possible so that um, we can start wanting to uh, experiment and try it all out, right, and see that it is possible. Um, Amy, what are your thoughts? So I think Peter kind of hit the nail on the head for this question. Um, and I'll come back to, I should have said my previous comment for now, but uh, yeah, policy and regulations is going to be one of the biggest driving factors here. Um, it's the way to start recognizing different systems. It's the way to start promoting different systems. Um, you know, it, the private sector can do a lot and we can keep driving it. We can keep the pressure on to change it, but we also need the public sector to come with us. So we need to convince them that this is a better way to, to do things. I mean, if you think about the public sector, they are all about doing things quickest and cheap as possible. And we're coming with solutions that are the benefits are much more long term and they do not have that vision. So it's to it's to start breaking down those barriers with those kinds of people and you know, people that are in the private sector that have the money to spend on projects that can actually create change, it's to also, you know keep on at them and keep trying to show them the benefits of this is why you should be doing this. This is why we need you to do this. This is why, or not need, this is why we want you to do this. Um, and it, I think we've got to also get quite comfortable with being stuck records and also comfortable with the idea that there are some people in this world who just simply do not care enough that are only about the short-term gain and will only ever be about the short-term gain. And Unfortunately, there's a, a lot of very powerful people in the world who sit in that particular category, which makes our job even more difficult. Um, but it, it does, we've got to just be resilient and keep pushing the buttons and keep, you know, doing the, the marketing campaign, keep doing the education campaign, keep finding new ways to get to new people, to educate new people. So yes, education, awareness, that is huge towards all of that. 
um, and to just keep being innovative and keep thinking and keep problem solving. And you know, you have an idea, don't immediately discard it. Talk to someone about it and see what comes of it. Um, I think there is another factor influencing. Well, <laughs> let me not say it like that. That's not really dumb. The main factor influencing all of the conversations, obviously, it's climate change, right? That's why we're having the conversations at all, because you know we don't actually want to live in a planet that completely burns up. Um, I mean, we won't be able to. And I think there is the saying, and it's a very true saying, that uh, necessity is the mother of all invention. And I think the worse and worse the problems start getting, the more and more and more people are going to be forced into these innovative ideas. So, you know, if you think about a lot of the problems we're witnessing in the world with natural disasters, with poverty, hunger, all those sorts of things are being made significantly worse and getting to a point where people in positions of power to change those things can no longer ignore them. You know, it, 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 we can't turn a blind eye to this stuff anymore, even if we want to, even if we don't, you know, care about it. it it's, you know, becoming more and more and more and more and more prevalent. Um, so I think that will have a, a quite an impact on changing things. And I think there are a lot of very last minute things that are going to happen. We are a very sort of last minute dot com type of species. You know, we don't do something until it's absolutely necessary to do it. Um, so I live in hope that that will that that does happen, that that will happen and that the change will get to a point where it does suddenly happen very, very quickly. But it's also important for, from our point of view, to be ready when it comes, to be ready with all of the ideas. We've got the research, we've got the ideas, we've got the innovation, we've got the way to fix everybody else's problems for when they are ready to acknowledge that they actually even have them. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, and, and it will take, again, it's, it's a collective effort, right? Um, and I like what you said about the fact that whether or not we care enough, the, the planet's burning up and it's not going to wait for us. Uh, we, yeah. it's, it's just a matter of what, what are we doing and how are we doing it uh, to, it's not even a matter of uh, trying to convince people. It's, it's, it's um, I think the fastest way to have change is to have the people that do know or that are willing uh, already take the action and then the rest will follow, right? Like when they start seeing the, the results and when they start seeing the work. Um, however, we do need policymakers um, uh, in there because then if, if, the, if there are policies uh, uh, holding us back or limiting us from doing certain things and there's no there's no point right we need the education because when people don't know why they do what they're doing then there's also no point so it's um a collective effort thank you very much um amy sorry pretty oh can i add one more more comment to that so there's another saying that we we like to use in the the green industry that we don't need everyone doing sustainability perfectly we need everyone doing sustainably sustainability imperfectly so whatever your little niche is that you're driving at keep driving at that because then the person next to you is driving another aspect of it and i'm terrible at getting very bogged down in trying to understand the holistic picture of it which is why i often get nowhere and forget that you know individual impacts done collectively that is where your power actually lies and i'll stop being philosophical now yeah thank you so being sustainable in in uh wherever you are in in your corner taking little steps right yeah thank you for that amy shane what are your thoughts about what components will drive transformation yeah i think um it's probably not such an easy answer um, of course, policy plays a role. There's no, we don't have a developer on the on the panel, so I can pick on them. You know, you need developers to obviously come to the party. Um, yeah, I mean, everyone, like Amy also said, you know, if everyone, you know, bring their bits of change, then of course it's a a bigger change that can happen. Um but I'm wondering, and I don't have an answer, but I'm wondering what the role of incentives could play 
in this in this um, changing it in South Africa because I remember back in the day when um, solar heating was a thing that got incentivized like every other person wanted the solar heater because they paid six thousand rand for it and they got a twenty thousand rand worth of a solar heating system that could give them hot water um so i'm just wondering what and it would be interesting to see especially uh beyond the sort of uh, circular economy just with the net zero carbon sort of initiatives in four different cities of our country it would be interesting to see how policy will actually shape that but also what incentives will what role that will play I don't know. I'm just wondering. Um, but yeah, other than that, I think uh, we could all we could all do our part in the meantime. Thank you for that, Shani. So, um, um, I mean, incentives definitely will encourage people to to do something because who doesn't want to be incentivized, right? And then I think in addition to incentives, taxes to the people who just refuse to, right? So like incentives and taxes, that can be uh, something that, that could motivate people. And that, that's, that's my thought. Uh, Miguel, what are your thoughts? So just jumping on the back of your taxes, so you can, yeah, I agree, I like that. Um, and yeah, just put a syntax on it, like with alcohol and cigarettes, uh, easy peasy. So, you know, if you're not building, in a circular approach or sustainable way than syntax. But I think really the people in the room here definitely have the ideas, they have the concepts. We're all on the same page. We know what we need to do. Um, the only way or the, the biggest key component for me is government. Uh, they're the only legislators that can actually make this happen. Um, if I look at solar geysers and the all the lighting uh, criteria and natural lighting and ventilation into buildings and how long that took to put into the regular uh, regulation documentation and the SBS documentation you know, yeah we'd be lucky to see a change within the next 15 years um, into there which then takes another 10 years to 15 years just to go into the industry because you know, I had my plans done and approved before you brought all the new regulations. So it's on the old regulations. Now I'm going to take my time. So the sad part is if it doesn't happen now, yeah, well, I think the people in this room would be lucky to see it happen in our lifetime. Um, not to be too, you know, <laughs> disheartening, but just from what I've experienced through, through my career in the built environment, um, I think the only plus factor is that it's not a country moving, it's the whole world trying to push this. Um, you know, if we look at the uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation, the EMF, I mean, they're getting people on board faster than anyone, um, you know, that are really punting this. I was lucky enough to be um, at the EMF Summit in the UK earlier this year. Um, we got an invitation, myself and the CEO went and, you know, you're rubbing shoulders with some of the biggest players in, in the Fortune 500 game. Um, and that's always a, a positive sign to see that, you know, it's those men and women that are coming to to these kinds of summits where people like myself that comes from an educational institution, you know, are rubbing shoulders with and chatting to because we all have the same outlook, you know, on, on, on what is it that we want to change. Uh, so... Yes, I think Africa, specifically South Africa, which was always targeted as the leading country in South Africa from an economic point of view, which has changed, yes, in recent history. But we've always been the leaders in South Africa, in particular on forward thinking up until recent history. So I think that just needs to change. And hopefully, if we if we can try and just jump on board with what I'm seeing or what I saw in, in even Asia uh, with their... G20 summit that's currently happening there, which is focusing on their economy, circular economy, from a financial aspect, as well as a, a, a broad base um, sort of infrastructure um, of, of money being pumped in. I mean, if we can just start to see that happening within Southern Africa or even Africa as a whole, I do think it could get fast-tracked, but we would require, really bottom line is we require um, the councils, 
OK, government to put those legislations in place and fast. And then I'd like to see the products, the hemp products and all of that actually become the norm, um, because it is something that could make the whole process a lot more um, efficient and a lot less uh, carbon emissions that are going out in, into the atmosphere. Um, well, that's at least yeah, my two cents. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for those points, Miguel. Um, um, I think from, from this discussion, from this entire discussion that we've had today, what I'm getting is that um, it's not just um, like the one part, which is the education part, right? You, this sector needs major support from the public sector. And if they don't come to the party, then you're essentially um, crippled in a way, and it's going to take forever to get anywhere. So uh, yeah, very interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Um, so final thoughts, uh, just before we close off. Amy, what are your final thoughts? Um, so I'm going to just tag on to the end of that about because we have been talking a lot about how we need policies to change we need the public sector to get involved for things to really really move and it is true we do need that but I think it is very key within that to remember that we in the private sector have a huge amount of power to influence that so as much as we need that we can't rely on that being the thing that happens it's being the thing that actually makes the big changes happening so you know when you're Renovating your house, for instance, what is it that you can do that drives that? You know, the more and more and more we, we start implementing things, the more we're also building up case studies and reasons and showing the things that these things that we're trying to, to bring in, that they do actually work, that they have benefits. And the more it happens, the more we also start seeing the long-term benefits coming through. So I think we, you know, we need to hold on to the fact that we do have a lot of power, we do have a lot of influence and you know, there are days and it's incredibly difficult and you don't, you know, you just kind of want to give up and say, oh, well, I'm not going to go and make a lot of money and just live my life. But, you know, we need to hold on to our passion and just not let it die. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Peter, what are your final thoughts? Um, final thoughts. I, I think this idea of, of you know, um, personally taking responsibility for the, you know, each one for their own sphere of influence um, is is really important, especially when you know, as a collective, suddenly that that then uh, picks up a lot of momentum. And I think we what is exciting um, about the day and age in which we live um, is this idea of social media and access to information. And I think being able to get the message out there on social media um, and and make people you know sort of grow people's awareness via that is is vital um and i mean movements like uh, you know the slow food movement coming out of italy for example was it sprung up kind of in in um in resistance to the fast food you know the proliferation of fast food all over the world um and and, and you know this group of people started up and they realized that um sort of unique regional flavors and recipes uh, were being lost actually uh, for future generations and you know they they spoke out against this and i mean they they have grown steadily but surely and i think in a similar way um it's almost like the movement that um, is in support of of you know circular thinking um I, I think it can grow and i think you know collectively that's where the power lies is when we personally uh, become aware and start to sort of make the right decisions and and, and have conversations like this you know a lot more often Thank you very much, Peter. Miguel, what are your final thoughts? Sorry about that, getting that mute button. Um, no, I think today was great and I agree. Uh, we need to have conversations like this and then and, and really, without sounding too corny, make the circle bigger. Um, you know, the more people that come into these conversations and go out there and start talking about it and start practicing it and start living it, the faster the change will happen. Um, I mean, that's like with anything. So yeah, that would be my final thoughts. I think a lot of us are doing it and I think a lot more people are doing it than, than we realize. 
Um, it's just about combining those voices and, and making a big noise to, to make the change. Absolutely. Um, I, I totally agree. Thank you very much, Miguel. Shane, final thoughts? Yeah, I like your little slogan here at the end, be aware of your own impact. I think that is definitely probably what, what it boils down to is um, if you are aware of your own impact, then even if it's a small, small little contribution, I mean, if everyone becomes more aware of that, then of course that could become like a, there could be like a snowball effect. Um, yeah. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much, Shane. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me today. So the recording of this video will be on my new YouTube channel, which is called Zero Waste TV. Um, that's what I'll be using to create awareness. More than anything, I would like to show uh, the vast opportunities that are in the green economy for South Africans. We're all complaining about the high um, number of um, unemployment rates and, um, you know, we, we are not being resourceful with what we have. I think we could be a little more creative if we looked around and um, maybe shared more information, more stories, more case studies, and um, more action. So uh, that is my aim. And my other aim is to just get us all together into collaboration mode and just stop working together. So thank you very much for your time. I truly appreciate you all. Amy, thank you. Peter, thank you so much for coming through. Miguel, I really appreciate you. Shane, thank you very much. Um, enjoy the rest of your day, ladies and gentlemen. Take care. Thank you, pretty. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Cheers. Bye. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone.